Um, hello, my name is Jeannie Regan Dinius, and I work for the Division of Historic Preservation and Archaeology, which is the State Preservation Office. And I'm a member of Preserving Historic Places Preservation Conference Planning Committee. We want to welcome you to one of our series of virtual conference sessions. Since we were unable to have the conference in 2020 uh, in person, we started doing these virtual sessions. And so I want to thank you for coming and attending this one. Now, I know we have been talking about an in-person conference in September, but we aren't quite there yet with COVID, the vaccines and such. So we are working on a one day virtual. Uh, it's looking like September 23rd. Keep an eye out for more information, the, uh, the date, the, uh, the schedule, all that kind of stuff. The planning committee has been uh, looking at some different ideas and different places, uh, topics to have and things like that. So we'll hopefully start getting information out about that. We hate to, hate to have to cancel an in-person one, but just not ready for it yet. I do wanna thank my co-administrators of the conference and these virtual um, lectures, Jessica Kramer and Suzanne Stannis, who are both from Indiana Landmarks. Without their help, none of these sessions would be available or would not happen. Um, and also the conference and the virtual session would not be possible without the generous financial support of our partners. Um, my office at the Indiana Division of Historic Preservation Archaeology, Indiana Landmarks, IU, and then also the St. Joseph County Commissioners um, has been supporting of us. Sponsors include RC Engineering, the City of South Bend, the Cornelius O'Brien Lecture Series, the Indiana Housing and Community Development Authority, Marvin Windows, the National Park Service, Wiss Janey Elsner Associates, and Visit South Bend, Mishawaka. And then we've also had some supporters who've been, uh, been so kind to us, um, Burlong, Cultural Resource Analysis, Historic Preservation and Heritage Consulting, Indiana Archaeology Council, um, Keyser Consulting, Old National Bank, and Ratio Architects, and R.E. Diamond Associates. So wherever you're sitting you now, just a nice little, little clap for um, all of the, their support that they've given us to make these um, events possible. So please uh, save the next talk or your next day is uh, Friday, April 23rd. It's our next virtual session. And Dr. Alex Badillo is going to speak. He's also from Indiana State University. And he's gonna talk about some exciting new technology that's being used to better study and interpret archeological sites, cemeteries. And he helped with these, the, um, the, the Bethel Cemetery and also structures. Now this one's a lunchtime one. So keep your eye out for more details. You can register tonight if you like, and we'll send the link out for registration to everyone. Now, again, we're using the, the webinar version of Zoom, so you won't have your microphones and your video is hidden. So please submit your questions in the Q&A portion, not the chat portion, because I'll keep an eye on that to um, make sure we get the questions for Dr. Drew as, as needed. And it will be, it is recorded, being recorded and will um, be available shortly after the presentation. And we'll be sending out the link as soon as we have that available. So now on to our speaker. And I'm very excited about this um, talk. Those of you who don't know me, I deal with the cemetery registry here in Indiana and Dr. Drew is who I wanna be when I grow up. Um, she relieved, received her Bachelor of Science and Master of Arts in Interdisciplinary Studies from Oregon State University. She earned her doctorate from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in 2018, and her uh, dissertation, Death and Anonymity, Population Dynamics and the Individual within the Milwaukee County Poor Farm Cemetery, 1882 to 1925. And it was she was recently granted the Kathleen Kirk Gilmore Dissertation Award um, by the Society of Historical Archaeology. So congratulations on that, Dr. Drew. In addition to being an adjunct professor at Indiana State University, she was a part of the Bethel Cemetery Relocation Project excavation team, and she supervised the material cultural analysis phase of the project and is currently editing the report, which I heard is like 1,800 pages, and I just can't wait to get that into our office. So I'll turn that over to you, Dr. Drew, and you can share your screen with us and enlighten us about the unmarked graves. Okay, well, hopefully everybody can see my screen here. Um, thank you all very much uh, for joining us tonight. I am very excited about this opportunity to share this amazing project with you. I'm gonna go ahead and jump right in because I have a lot, uh, probably too much to try to share with you tonight. So I, I wanna make sure to, to, to get through everything. 
The relocation of Bethel Cemetery, uh, which was active between 1827 and 1935, was necessitated by unavoidable infrastructure improvements at the adjacent Indianapolis Airport Authority property. This project required federal approval under the National Environmental Policy Act from the Federal Aviation Administration, and therefore Section 106 of the Historic Preservation Act was applicable. The airport authority initially uh, contracted Cardinal to conduct background research, field documentation, and geophysical survey of the 0.8 acre cemetery. Ultimately, Cardinal was also tasked with the excavation of all graves, rigorous analysis of both human remains and material culture, and the reinterment of all burials and associated artifacts at a new cemetery location. Professors from IUPUI, University of Indianapolis, and Indiana State University were brought on to assist during all phases of the relocation. Excavation began in May 2018 and wrapped up the following August. The reburial and rededication of the new Bethel Cemetery occurred in the summer of 2019. However, this complex project is still very much ongoing. A full detailed account of all components is beyond the scope of tonight's talk, even though I, I tried, um, but I know other presentations on different aspects of this work are planned for the near future. So tonight I'm just going to focus on one specific aspect of this mammoth project, the identification of excavated burials. After providing a very brief historical background to the cemetery and its prominent families, as well as an overview of the archaeological and lab analysis phases, I'll share with you the various types of data that have been collected and synthesized in our efforts to get back to the names to those whose identity had been erased from the cemetery landscape. So as you'll see throughout tonight's discussion, there's very little surviving documentation directly related to the cemetery itself or the church in which it would eventually become associated. In fact, we don't have any um, surviving uh, contemporary documents uh, for either the, the cemetery or the church. Uh, the, the cemetery was originally on the property of John McCreary in section 26, Township 15 North, Range 2 East, near the border of Decatur and Wayne Townships in Mary County, Indiana. Though in this 1866 map showing the location of the cemetery, that portion of land appears to have already changed hands. Any hey, Brooke, can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Can you slow down just a tad bit? I'll try. I know you've got a lot to get in, but if you can slow down just a tad bit, that would be great. Yes, I will. I, I apologize. I, my, my students uh, at ISU complain about that, that same thing all the time. Okay, so in 1822, John and his brother Daniel, who were living in Highland County, Ohio at the time, scouted the recently opened for purchase Indiana Wilderness and returned with their families a few years later, each filing land patents at, uh, on 80 acres each in 1825 and 1826 respectively. They not only brought their very large immediate families that included both young and adult children, but like so many who would eventually settle in the Midwest, drew several extended family groups to the area as well. Many of these would form the foundation of the community that would use, utilize Bethel Cemetery for generations. And we can see here in this list of some of the early Decatur and Wayne Township pioneers, um, all of who would eventually be buried in Bethel, almost all of these gentlemen are actually related to each other through marriage, um, with the sort of the exception of William Poland, who actually um, was not related to anybody by marriage, but did serve under Daniel McCreary uh, during the War of 1812. So they had that connection to each other as well. So these gentlemen and the others that would settle to cater in away in townships were farmers transforming the heavily wooded area into successful agricultural ventures. The area would remain rural well into the 20th century, but these pioneers, despite difficult travel, were still close enough to take advantage of the growing urban center in Indianapolis, which was established as the state capital in 1820. When John's mother, Mary, uh, died in 1827, a burial site was selected near the property boundary he shared with his sister, Mary Jane, and her husband, Parker Killow, who had acquired the property just west of John in 1825. And here we have uh, some of the biographical information that we've been able to gather on Mary McCreary. Um, she was born in Virginia in 1757 and uh, married Daniel um, Greathouse, but he unfortunately passed away uh, a few years after that. So she then remarried Andrew McCreary in 1780, and they would go on to have seven children children, uh, three of which, uh, again, that we know were buried at Bethel Cemetery, and one of which, uh, Rachel Fike, who died in 1831, I am pretty sure was buried there, but don't have any supporting documentation for that quite yet. So for all intents and purposes, the cemetery, which seems to have been referred to as the McCreary Cemetery for a time, was a familial burial ground. While the earliest known burials represent several different surnames, most can be traced back to the McCreary's or one of the other pioneer families through blood or marriage. In 1850, John and his wife, Marianne Dave McCreary, deeded a quarter of an acre of their property to the establishment of the Bethel Methodist Episcopal Church. 
in one of the few documents we have that deals directly with the cemetery or the church. We can see that dozens of Decatur and Wayne Township residents contributed funds and service to the creation of this congregation. This included many of the area's founding families, including the Killows, Davids, Winings, Wilsons, Hoffmans, and Folsons, just to name a few. The cemetery became tied to the church, making it the burial ground for the congregation. Though no longer a family burial plot, we can see the interconnected nature of the local uh, families ensured that most of those interred there were related to one, if not many, of the original founding families. So this is a diagram that I have put together while working on the final report because I, I really wanted uh, a, a visual to sort of show the, the way these, these families were so closely connect, connected through multiple generations. Um, and you can sort of see how um, the, there's, we had siblings marrying siblings from other families. Um, so for many gen different generations, they, they sort of formed this bond to each other. And I can tell you while I was trying to connect all of these dots with all the information um, that I have gathered that the image that I could not get out of my head was of this guy. Um, and I'm pretty sure anybody who uh, does genealogy or does this kind of work, um, when you're dealing with closely connected families who all like uh, to share the same names, you can probably sympathize with the, the sentiment sort of displayed in this meme of just trying to get all those dots connected. So the cemetery appears to have been very active throughout the remainder of the 19th century with several generations of these prominent families uh, burying their loved ones there. However, as the 20th century progressed, more and more descendants of these founding families either moved out of the area or selected larger, more established cemeteries like West Newton to the south or Crown Hill in Indianapolis. I mean, this map here it is um, part of a series that, again, that I put together for the report, sort of displaying land ownership around um, Bethel Cemetery through time. On this last one here from 1931, you can see uh, the areas that are in sort of the, the bluish green color um, are the last landowners um, in Decatur Township that would eventually uh, be buried in Bethel. While the orange are individuals who had family members buried at Bethel, but who would eventually be buried elsewhere. And also note um, the city of Indianapolis Municipal Airport, uh, that, which was just established um, just north of John McCurry's original property in 1931. So the nature of the landscape surrounding the small church and its cemetery also began to change in the early 20th century, becoming less agricultural and more industrial and commercial, and this included the airport. So though the church remained in its original location until the 1960s, the last known burial was John W. Curtis on the 18th of September, 1935. John's father, Private Thomas Curtis, died during the Civil War and was brought back to Marion County for burial at Bethel in 1865. His mother, Ruth Shelton Curtis, uh, survived her husband by 35 years, but was still laid to rest by his side in 1888. John's wife, Martha Bassett Williamson Curtis, uh, had been buried in Bethel in 1913. After the Bethel um, ME Church moved, descendants of the original Bethel community still came to um, the site to pay their respects, but management of the cemetery itself fell to local government. In 1976, there was a series of articles published in the Indianapolis News detailing not only erosion issues at the cemetery, but its overgrown and neglected condition. Though they did not own the property, the Indianapolis Airport Authority repaired the problematic drainage ditch, which was causing the erosion. The dilapidated state of the cemetery seemed hard, harder to rectify. State law dictated that the Office of the Decatur Township Trustee maintain cemeteries without active responsible entities, but at the time, the trustee seemed to be having issues with the contractor being paid to do basic landscaping. A gentleman from the West Newton LDS Church organized a restoration effort, and volunteers from his congregation, as well as several airport authority employees, cleared the overgrown brush and attempted to repair many of the fallen monuments. So as you can see here, the monuments here for Elijah, uh, uh, Eliza J. McCrary Hoffman and her husband John Hoffman um, had been fallen off their base, but um, were uh, uh, put back on and uh, fixed uh, likely during this restoration project. Though we do have evidence that some did not necessarily uh, uh, survive the intervening year as well, as we can see this the marker for the Hoffman's um, uh, uh, standing on its base in 1976. But when we started the, the burial project in 2018, had been pushed over by this very large tree that had been planted in the middle of the cemetery. 
So um, that is a, the very, very brief historical background of the cemetery. Um, I would love to go into more, but I'm gonna go ahead and move on to a very brief description of the excavation analysis phases uh, of the, the, the project to get a little bit of context of the, the type of data that we've collected and the way that it's being sort of used again to identify a, a lot of these burials. Um, so first, all above ground material culture um, and the landscape itself was mapped, photographed, and subjected to structure from motion photogrammetry prior to any sort of disturbances. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail into what exactly structure from motion photogrammetry is. Um, that is actually Dr. Petitio's specialty, and he will be giving his talk on April 23rd. But basically, um, what we were able to do was take um, a lot of different photos of each grave marker and stitch them together in, in a specific program to create 3D models that they can then be manipulated and viewed from all sorts of different angles um, with, within this particular program. So every grave marker uh, was a, a photogrammetry and where legible basic biographical information on each monument was also recorded. A total of 172 um, full or partial grave markers were mapped. However, many were broken or so worn that names and dates uh, were not, uh, could not be read. Several had clearly been moved from the original locations and several commemorated more than one individual. Um, so ultimately, uh, 142 names were recorded from grave markers prior to any sort of other activity happening out of the cemetery. And I want to go ahead and point out this uh, marker for a normal Russell, Russell Ferguson, uh, which is leaning up against a, a different marker, um, because I'm going to circle back around to him towards the end of the talk, because there's some really interesting things going on with this particular marker. So after the, the cemetery was, uh, the markers were mapped and photographed, um, we had to do conduct some uh, geophysical survey. So anyone with experience in historic cemeteries knows that what can be seen on the surface is usually only a fraction of who was buried there. So therefore we implemented ground penetrating radar and electrical resist resistivity um, were, uh, methods to conduct, uh, conducted to get a better sense of how many burials were likely to be encountered. A total of 370 burial shafts from both marked and unmarked graves were identified through these methods. In the early reporting, it was noted that there were likely additional graves that were not evident in the geophysical data, including the high likelihood for more infants and children. And it was concluded that it was feasible that more than 400 or in four, between 400 and 450 internments, possibly more, were located within Bethel Cemetery. When it came time to excavate, um, standard bioarchaeological excavation techniques were utilized. Uh, this included mechanical stripping down to the top of the burial shaft, which was usually detected by soil discoloration and orange staining caused by the coffin nails at the um, on the lids. Um, and each of these features was then assigned a unique identifying burial number. Uh, then each burial was hand excavated using established protocols, uh, including utilizing only wooden tools to prevent damage to the remains and keeping grave goods and coffin hardware in situ for mapping and photo documentation. Burials were then fully documented on standardized excavation forms, and this uh, documentation also included traditional plan view photography at multiple states of exhumation. So for instance, um, up here from the burial 51, uh, Susanna Bassett Warth, um, she was one of many who had these very large um, viewing panes uh, that had been in her original coffin. So we made sure to fully photo document um, that material before it was removed uh, to uncover the remains. And where preservation permitted uh, structure from motion photogrammetry, um, the same methods that were used to 3D document the, the markers was it implemented for uh, the burials as well. So we actually do um, have um, full 3D models uh, of many of the burials that were excavated at, at Bethel. Um, the artifacts and remains were then carefully removed, bagged and cataloged and taken to an off-site lab. Special attention was given to the burials of known veterans, including the placement of an American flag on the boxes containing the remains and a police escort to the offsite lab. Um, due to the extant grave markers and the diligence of one of our team members, who was also an active duty guardsman, we are aware of the locations for 10 veterans, or at least we thought we knew where 10 veterans were, more to come on that later, um, prior to the excavation. Um, so we knew where the markers for these individuals were. So when it came time to remove those burials, we um, wanted to make sure that the, the proper protocols uh, were in place. We did find uh, two additional burials that were unmarked that we believe uh, contained the remains of veterans. Um, burial 198, a young adult male, uh, likely interred sometime in the 1860s, um, was found with these uh, Civil War uh, 
uh, infantry officer buttons. So I believe he was likely entered in his uniform. Uh, but unfortunately, again, since his burial was unmarked, we're not sure who he is. And then burial uh, 200 was a middle-aged male uh, interred sometime between 1875 and 1889, likely, uh, was interred with this coffin plaque. Uh, which you know, is very, very difficult to see anything on it in this photo. And I can tell you it was actually very, very difficult to see anything even when you had it in your hands and, and were looking at it. But we were able to identify it in an 1885 um, Coffin Harbor catalog as being a commemorative plaque for the Grand Army of the Republic, which was a fraternal organization for Civil War veterans. And again, even though you can't see it, enough of the lettering was visible sort of with um, the right lighting uh, that we could see that the, the, the word comrade had actually been inscribed on, on this plaque as well. Um, one of the other things that we had to, to, to deal with um, that you know, we weren't necessarily used to uh, with historic cemeteries um, is the concrete vaults. Uh, we encountered them really um, quickly when we began the mechanical stripping process, and it was decided that we would hire professional vault movers uh, to remove them to a secure location until reburial. Um, and you can actually see me here having abandoned all pretense of actually working, uh, leaving my, my wonderful dick partner at the screen, watching them remove uh, this very large concrete slab that had actually been poured around sort of an inner metal, uh, metal vault. And I was convinced that this was going to go horribly wrong, but these guys really know what they were doing and, and managed to move all of these vaults uh, without any issues. Um, there were 26 vaults in total, um, and most, uh, it was decided, would be uh, left intact and not opened. However, five had to be opened in the lab um, after they had been moved from the field because the conditions of the vaults were so poor that the, the vault movers were concerned about their integrity before moving them again. So this provided us with an amazing opportunity to study some very um, well-preserved remains and material culture. Um, so, for instance, we almost never get uh, good preservation of organic material, in, including clothing and, and textiles in historic cemetery excavation. But here, the, the burial um, nine was a, a woman named Gertrude Forrest Bailey, who unfortunately died in 1908 at the age of 30 from tuberculosis. Uh, we had almost a complete uh, burial, burial, um, funerary robe, as well as uh, shoes uh, fully intact within that burial. And the opening of this vault actually provided us uh, with some more information that I'm going to mention a little bit later that helped us um, to identify uh, one of these uh, individuals. So ultimately, the 450 or more burial estimation based on remote sensing was pretty accurate. Um, 540 burial features were identified during the excavation phase. Um, so honestly, with the remote sensing technology, a lot of times there's a lot of unknowables. So the fact that we even got in within uh, 100 uh, of the estimation is actually a pretty good use of that technology. Post-excavation analysis uh, was broken up into two parts. The remains were sent to the secure facilities at either IUPUI or UND for analysis. Um, and the mature culture, including the unopened vaults, monuments, and artifacts were brought to a very large, highly secure location provided by the airport authority for Carno to use as a storage and a lab. And the picture here in the, in the middle is just actually just a portion of uh, this facility um, that was loaned to us during this project. So this allowed us to have access to all of the, uh, the monuments and the markers, um, as well as the vaults uh, when necessary throughout the entire uh, analysis phase, which was, was really crucial to not only gathering more data, but again, um, to the, uh, the identification process. And adjoining um, this very large uh, empty warehouse was several offices that we were able to convert into labs where we cleaned, analyzed, and documented um, all of the artifacts. Um, I worked to catalog and identify all the material culture, and as we'll see in a moment, these identifications would prove vital in establishing estimated dates of burial for unmarked internments. Every marker was cleaned and if damaged, repaired, and a cemetery preservation expert was kind enough to join in this time um, to travel to the lab and demonstrate this restoration process. It is a skill that was not only important to the Bethel Cemetery Relocation Project, but one that has already been utilized multiple times by Cardinal team members working on other cemetery restoration projects. Having access to the newly cleaned and restored markers allowed Cardinal Lab Supervisor Jillian O'Cray to spearhead a more detailed grave marker survey. This generated considerable more biographical data, as many of the markers were much easier to read after being cleaned and reassembled. And this process would also prove to be an important part of reassociating a number of misplaced markers. 
After all analyses were complete, it was time to start the reburial process. Uh, Concordia Cemetery in Indianapolis was selected for a reburial location as they were one of the only cemeteries in the area with the open space and dedicated full-time staff capable of taking on 540 new burials at once. And while space constraints made it um, impossible to completely recreate Bethel Cemetery exactly as it was, every effort was made to ensure that familiar groups stayed together in the new layout. So we made sure that individuals who were buried next to each other in the original Bethel Cemetery were buried next to each other in the new cemetery as well. Each interment received a newly um, constructed concrete vault and all human remains and material culture were carefully placed within the vault for reburial. Prior to any activity in the New Bethel Cemetery, Reverend Bob Coleman, a Methodist minister and a descendant of the McCreary and Cowardger families, reconsecrated the ground. Rows were excavated for the newly vaulted burials, which each, with each burial location being carefully marked by the cemetery crew, which was important because after all of the vaults were reburied, uh, we placed all of the um, markers uh, over the appropriate burials. So after reinterment, the newly repaired and clean monuments were erected and new granite markers were uh, acquired to commemorate unidentified burials. And it was important that the burial number was discreetly included on this marker as it is hoped that as future identifications are being made, these burials can then be easily located and possibly recommemorated um, with the new markers. I um, mean, you can see those burial markers here uh, on, in the corner of the, the new granite markers. A rededication ceremony was organized by the airport authority and was held on September 28th, 2018. Um, this well attended event included representatives from the state government, uh, the airport authority, the, the Cardinal team and various War of 1812 and Civil War reenactors. A local National Guard unit was also on hand to pay their respects with a howitzer, which I'm not entirely sure the surrounding community thoroughly appreciated, but it was an awesome display. Um, and Reverend uh, Bob Coleman returned to speak uh, and many other Bethel Cemetery descendants were attendants, many with arms full of genealogical information that they wanted to share, which was something that we very much appreciated. A large scale version of the reburial plan map was also provided so that they could easily find the new burial locations for their ancestors. Okay, now I'm going to briefly describe the resources uh, that we've used in our attempts to identify unknown burials. And keep in mind, we had 540 burials, but only 142 names based on the monuments. And as we'll see in a moment, not all of the markers actually turned out to be accurate. Um, but the synthesis of multiple bioarchaeological and historical lines of evidence has allowed us to identify a number of unmarked burials, as well as generate a list of previously unknown individuals who interred at Bethel. So the exact methods and procedures used to generate the osteobiographies are far too complex to go into now and should really be dealt with by one of the bioarchaeologists on our team who know a lot more about them than I do. But very briefly, um, for each burial, where possible, there was an age estimation, an assessment of biological sex, and analyses of pathologies, trauma, and health. And here is um, here in the middle is just a screenshot of one of the many different modules uh, of the computer program that the bioarchaeologists use to store that data and sort of analyze and come up with their conclusions. Um, and then short osteobiographies were then written for each burial describing the conclusions of these assessments. So here I have an example of, of burial 19, which they determined to be a young adult male somewhere between the ages of 20 to 35, likely around 27.5 years. And the little narrative at the bottom sort of describes the condition of the remains as they were found and the justifications for the conclusions of, of sex and um, age that they came up with, as well as a brief description of the pathological conditions that they observed on the remains, which in this case included some issues uh, with the back as well as some cavities in the teeth. The years in, with, um, in which Bethel was act most active occurred during the height of what historians and archeologists call the beautification of death movement. Ideological attitudes towards death, coupled with a growing commercial funerary industry, contributed to a desire to commemorate loved ones with highly decorative burial cases styled like jewelry boxes for the dead. And thanks to the extensive work done by Dr. James Davidson of the University of Florida, we have very robust chronologies for much of this mortuary material culture, which then allows us to come up with estimated dates of interment for the burials that contain that material culture. So just a few examples um, to sort of demonstrate uh, some of these uh, artifacts that we can use to come up with these dates um, are various different ways in which um, the, the lids to coffins were secured with fasteners. We sort of have this evolution from coffin screws, which came about around 1850, um, to uh, thumb screws, uh, which were first developed, the first generation, in 1869. 
Um, you can see those here on the left. But these were relatively um, quickly replaced by what is termed second generation thumb screws, which were then in turn also uh, replaced by third generation thumb screws. So while these relatively um, insignificant seeming artifacts are actually one of the most um, important temporal indicators of when certain burials might have happened. We know that if a um, burial, for instance, has a second generation thumb screw, it is likely that that burial happened uh, or um, occurred sometime between 1871 and 1875, um, which is, a, you know, archaeologically speaking, is actually an extremely tight uh, a date um, when it comes to looking at uh, artifacts. Different types of handles um, were also uh, prevalent and changed throughout uh, the, the, the sort of beautification of death period. Um, you have double lug swing bells, which are the, the type here, double lug short bars and extension bars. Um, they all have established dates for when they were sort of patented and um, available in catalogs, but also um, when they became sort of commonly used among the public and we can, when we can sort of expect to see them in, in the archaeological record. And having so many marked and identified burials at Bethel, um, we were able to sort of use those burials as sort of the control to, to, to figure out when exactly different types uh, of artifacts were, were sort of introduced in, into this particular cemetery, into this population, and sort of, again, use those to come up with estimated dates uh, for unmarked burials as well. Um, just a couple other uh, interesting artifacts that we can sort of use to provide dates, including um, uh, coffin plaques, um, which, you know, mass produced uh, cast ones like this were introduced about 1880 um, and later and often had said something like at rest or mother or father. But we had a few that said sister or brother as well at Bethel. And then again, the, the viewing windows, which came in a variety of uh, shapes and sizes uh, throughout the years in which they were, were used within coffins. So taking all the available chronolo chronological data for the different types of burial cases and decorative fittings, it's possible to establish an eternal chronology for burials at Bethel. And it's important to note that not a single one type of artifact defines a burial period, um, but rather a suite of variables that are taken together. Additionally, these are not hard and fast assessments. It is possible that a burial from 1901 may have characteristics more like those from a late A period burial, which technically ended in 1899. And also you can see here that the early A period um, is defined most by the lack of any decorative fittings. Um, it is possible that someone would be buried during a later period in a plain coffin, but given what we know from this burial population, in most cases, the lack of a bejeweled um, burial case was due to an early internment uh, prior to the beautification of death movement. I emphasize in most cases, because I will present to you a, a case study towards the end that, that proves the exception to this rule. So all this information has been put together in a map that has been vital to the identification process. Um, it includes the, the temporal uh, assessments, um, which you can see here in various shades of green, yellow, and red, green being the earliest, uh, yellow the middle, and red the latest. Um, and you can sort of see, just looking at this map, that the sort of the general um, progression that the, the cemetery made uh, through the years, with the earliest burials, I believe, being actually in this particular row right here. And I will tell you why uh, in a little bit. Um, but in addition to the temporal data, the identification, the osteological data for unidenti unidentified individuals and the biographical information for identified individuals was added. And I can go ahead and maybe, it's not going to let me zoom in, never mind. Um, but if you could see it a little bit more clearly uh, in Zoom, that uh, this uh, being able to have all this data together in, in one visual sort of allows you to start looking at um, the family patternings, you know, how families tended to be organized within the cemetery. So that way, you know, if you have an unidentified burial that is um, buried in relation or in close proximity to um, somebody who was marked, uh, that you can then go through the genealogical data, look at the family tree for that individual and, and see if you can find somebody um, who may have died uh, during a time period that was consistent with those artifacts, as well as um, who had a biological sex and age that would be consistent with the, the osteological um, uh, profiles that were um, uh, assessed or given. Okay, so um, with the historical and genealogical resources, uh, we had quite a few that we can with, that we were able to work with, and that were actually provided to us relatively early on in the project by Nancy Stray at the Marion County Genealogical Society. Um, and while these were extremely helpful in that they provided us with a, a list of um, burials, uh, they were somewhat limited in a lot of different ways. Um, the, the biggest one being that. 
they were um, not a burial register, uh, which would be uh, just absolutely amazing if we could find one of those for Bethel, but a uh, grave marker survey. So at, at some point, I think in the, the mid 20th century, maybe the 1840s, 1850s, I, I do have one here that was dated specifically um, from 1957. Somebody went out to the cemetery and wrote down the information that they, they saw on the markers. So again, this is not a, a, a representative, this is a, not a complete comprehensive list of everybody that is buried there. Um, the other problem that we ran into with all of these documents is they have all been rearranged by in alphabetical order by surname, um, which is very handy for genealogical work. But when um, you start wanting to potentially reassociate names with burials, um, all that spatial data gets lost. Um, so we, we don't know which order those burials might have been in the cemetery. And it also um, sort of uh, 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 obscures a lot of the familial connections between individuals. Um, we had a number of sort of family groups within the cemetery that had many different surnames with, within the family. There, there's one row in particular that I can think of that um, the Bray, Bailey, Brown, Copeland, and Dickinson uh, uh, were all immediate family members, mainly they were uh, adults and married daughters who were buried next to their parents and then their maternal grandmother. Um, but by rearranging all this information by surname, that those connections are, are sort of lost uh, within these documents. But this was a really good jumping off point in our attempt to start coming up with a more comprehensive burial list. Um, I've heavily utilized um, a lot of the online um, genealogical information, uh, mainly through Ancestry.com, um, including marriage records, which again are, are really vital in um, establishing, again, those relationships between families and, and, and individuals. Um, the federal censuses are really um, important uh, in establishing the residence location and family composition, including the number, uh, age, um, and, and gender of children. Um, but the death certificates obviously are ones that are, are really important um, for this kind of research because it actually provides a place of burial on the death certificate. I mean, we are lucky here in Indiana that um, state death records uh, post-1900 are available online uh, through Ancestry. Unfortunately, though, anybody who has worked with these documents knows that the, the search functionality um, built into Ancestry it leaves a lot to be desired, particularly when it comes to death certificates. There is no way to simply search Bethel Cemetery or uh, for a particular place of burial, though the way they are entered um, into their database. So I had to get extremely creative um, in, in trying to come up with strategies for finding death certificates for people whose names I didn't know and who dates of death I didn't know, but who um, were buried uh, in the, our, our research cemetery. Um, and I, I probably spent way more time um, doing all of that than I really needed to, but I, I did find actually quite a few death certificates, post-1900 death certificates um, for individuals buried at Bethel that we were unaware of um, prior to, to sort of doing that, that deep dive into those records. Um, ideally, some at some point, we will be able to get access to the, the original Marion County death records because they go um, back uh, much earlier um, and may potentially um, help us uh, come up with uh, some more names to add to our list uh, of potential burials. Um, I then, uh, throughout this entire process, I had created a tree, um, uh, the Bethel Cemetery, Marion County, Indiana, Ancestry.com tree, that houses all of the information that we have been able to collect on the entire burial population. Um, so it's, it's a fantastic resource in that it stores all of the records that we have been able to find and, and tags them to those individuals so that we can then have a profile page with all of that information that we have found. One of the things that I have found most useful, and, and I actually wasn't aware that this um, was something that you can do until I just sort of stumbled upon it, is Ancestry lets you create what they call custom tags. Um, for each of your records. And so I was a, I created tags for known Bethel burial, um, buried elsewhere, um, possible Bethel burial, and unknown burial location. So as I started working through the family trees and starting with the individuals that we knew were buried at Bethel and working through uh, subsequent generations, I would mark each one as, you know, this person I know was buried someplace else. This person died while Bethel was uh, active and I can't find burial records for them anywhere else. They could possibly be uh, a Bethel burial. And you can actually search and filter through all of the individuals in your family tree using those custom tags. So that's a, a really um, useful tool uh, within that, uh, those trees. 
Additionally, um, all of the individuals that we know are, sus are suspected to be buried at Bethel um, have been added to the Bethel uh, Relocation Project uh, uh, database, which houses all the information that we have from the excavation, the osteodata, and the material culture analyses. Um, so here in, in this uh, sort of screenshot of what that table looks like, you can see that we have the grave marker uh, number if they did have a grave marker and the basic biographical information. But I, I can also track um, which of the cemetery documents that we have um, mentions those individuals. So I know when or how or where each person is listed and whether or not they have a death certificate. Now, one to sort of take note of here is in this column right here that says cemetery book. Um, and it is actually a document that uh, I stumbled across about a year ago, less than a year ago now, um, at this genealogical collection uh, at the State Library. Um, it was, uh, I had been planning on going to the State Library for a while. I wanted to get access to the originals uh, of a lot of the scans that we had been given and see if there was any more information. Um, but it was the beginning of March and rumors of a lockdown were starting to happen. So I just decided to go as quickly as I can because I, I didn't know when I was going to be able to get back in the library. And I'm really glad I did. Um, because this document, which was found by an exceptionally helpful um, librarian, ha has, was, has been really sort of um, the most important one that we have so far. Um, I don't know a lot about it. There wasn't a lot of information associated with the document other than that it seemed to have been commissioned by the Union Title Company in Indianapolis and was generated sometime around 1895, um, sometime in the early 1890s for sure. Um, and this, you can see here, this image here, it's, um, this was some sort of early like 1920 version of um, photocopy, but I have inverted that image in Photoshop so you can sort of see a lot more clearly um, what uh, was in this document. So this was the front matter here um, on that document. And again, the, several cemeteries were included um, in this register. And, and Bethel was originally just listed as a cemetery East 1 half 26 15 2. Unfortunately, somebody recognized as, as, that as Bethel and made a note of that, which ended up in the librarian's records. So she was able to find it when she did the search for me. The most exciting thing about this document even though it is also just another gravestone survey, it's significantly earlier than the other ones that we have, and it's handwritten. So the names have not been rearranged by surnames. So I knew immediately that there was some spatial information sort of embedded or encoded in the way, in the order in which um, the names were listed uh, in the, throughout the, the pages that were on there. So at this point, I have literally become the crazy guy with the, the red string, because um, what I did was I, I took my identification map and I removed all the burials um, that would have happened after the, this survey seem, uh, was done. Um, and I started with the first entry and I just drew lines from every known uh, or marked burial that was listed in that book. Um, and just sort of basically retrace the path of the individual who um, did this, this survey. And what I found was when you connected the dot in between two known individuals, if somebody who was listed between them was an unknown or unmarked individual, I knew that that person's burial was going to be somewhere in between those two knowns. So that I can then go to the map and try to find any burial with along those lines um, that had an osteo profile and artifacts that would be consistent with the, the date and age and, and um, uh, biological sex of that individual. And I was actually able to identify quite a few burials of, in, of individuals that we either knew were buried there but couldn't find um, or uh, individuals whose names that we hadn't even been aware of yet. So while this map does look like a crazy person put it together, it actually ended up being an extremely useful identification tool. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about what you all are actually here to, to hear about is how we actually have gone about identifying some of these burials. First one, uh, the first method we used was the grave markers themselves. And um, while this seems straightforward and, and common sense, we were actually very careful to make sure that um, the, the information, the biographical information that was on the markers was consistent with uh, the burial that it was associated with, again, when it came to the, the artifact and the osteo profiles. So here we have an example of um, uh, Ada Mae Brown, uh, Bailey Brown, who I, I just mentioned a, a little uh, while ago, um, who died in 1896 at 20 years uh, and 24 days. Um, everything in her burial, the artifacts that you see here, were all consistent with a late A period burial, which again would be from 1890 to 1899. And the analysis of a young adult female around 20 years is spot on with um, the information that we had for her. Another example um, is Gustavus McCreary. 
um, which is a really interesting uh, burial because he was one of the only ones buried in this type of coffin. It's a, a I think probably zinc uh, sort of sheet metal coffin. Um, and I believed that he was buried in, in, in this kind of burial case um, because he did die out of state in Alabama during the Civil War uh, from disease in 1864 and was shipped back home um, for burial in the, in the family cemetery. So this, this coffin is consistent with an 1864 burial. Uh, the remains are consistent with the information that we had um, about Mr. McCurry or Private McCurry. Um, and it was all consistent, again, with the Civil War um, marker that we found with this burial. What was really exciting about this one was Reverend Coleman, who again is a McCurry descendant, actually came out to visit the site just a couple of days after this particular burial um, was exposed and said that no, uh, the, it had always been sort of a mystery in the family as to whether or not um, Gustavus had been brought back um, and actually buried in the cemetery, or if this marker was more uh, of a cenotaph and he was buried uh, somewhere in Alabama. So we were actually able to um, confirm to his family that yes, he was actually buried there at Bethel. But again, the markers are not only a, not always as straightforward as they seem. We have the case here of the Pearson family, um, who were uh, markers Q4, 5, and 6. And um, when everything was mapped out and we took a look at it, we realized that uh, markers 4 and 6 were not actually associated with any particular burial. And then while Q5, uh, the osteological profile of a um, older adult female was consistent with Elizabeth um, Pearson's uh, age um, and sex, the artifacts I found associated were much later than what you would expect for a burial from 1863. But looking at the map, we were able to very quickly sort of assess that uh, when these markers were placed, uh, likely sometime long after the, the family had passed, because these are not markers that you would expect from um, the 1860s or 1870s, uh, the family or whoever erected them was just one row off. So we were able to reassociate these markers with the appropriate um, uh, burials when we did the, re uh, the reburial process. Um, this is going back to our where we thought we knew where all of our veterans were, um, the case of Robert O. Lehman. Um, we knew the, where his marker was, so we knew when we um, went to do the, the burial uh, here marked as 248, um, we wanted to be ready to again enact those protocols that we had come up for veteran burials. Um, you can imagine the excavator's surprise when they came down on the burial of a very, very small individual um, who was determined later by the, the osteologist to actually be a four to six year old child. Um, so obviously this is not Robert O. Lehman. Um, we are not entirely sure why his marker was in this particular spot. Um, we've been in communication and have met several times with some of the Lehman family descendants and they too are sort of unclear as to how exactly um, this situation came to play. So that, that is, uh, again, something that we are working on and we'll hopefully be able to identify um, Robert uh, Lehman's actual um, burial sometime soon. Another one, um, a marker that was in sort of the wrong place uh, that has been sort of partially solved um, is that of the Comptons. Um, you can see here we have a sort of large uh, um, obelisk style marker for Obadiah and Melinda McCurry Compton, um, but it was found here. You can see H3 sort of floating in the middle of an empty space, not associated with a, an actual, um, uh, any actual burials. And H2 here was just sort of a broken um, slab marker with no uh, biographical information uh, left on it. So we were unsure as to where either one of these individuals were for quite a while until, again, I, I came across the, the Union Title Cemetery book um, last year in which uh, Obadiah's burial was um, listed. Um, and he was listed between the known burials of uh, Lucinda Hoffman and Ann Cowager here and here. So I knew Obadiah was buried somewhere along this line. And burial 19, the one that I showed you towards the beginning of the presentation, um, was the only one within that particular area that had a young adult um, osteo profile with artifacts that again are, would be consistent with an 1839 burial. In fact, if we go back again to the osteological analysis, um, they assessed his age at 27 and a half years when he was 28 years and one month. So again, that is an extremely accurate estimation. Still, I'm not entirely sure where Melinda is, and that is again something else I'm, I'm looking to rectify. 
Um, buried monuments. Um, we also had silver monuments that had fallen over and had been covered with dirt and sod throughout the years. Um, we would come across these often uh, during the mechanical stripping process, in which case we would stop, they would get a unique identifying number and then would be mapped and then sort of moved out of the way, um, knowing that we would then probably be able to reassociate them with their appropriate burials later. And in this case, these three that you see here were ones that had remained close enough to their original locations that we were able to figure out pretty quickly again, based off of the, the data that we gathered, where they were supposed to go so they could be, uh, again, reassociated with the appropriate burial. Then we have a burial um, or BM for the BM48 feature, but we have officially sort of term, uh, termed the pit. Um, we came down, again, relatively early in the excavation process on what was we thought was a, a single buried monument, but as it was sort of being exposed to be removed to continue stripping, one monument turned into another, which turned into um, quite a few more. Um, in fact, we ended up with um, 23 uh, monuments, or at least 23 monuments that we were able to read any biographical information on. And again, most of them were broken in, in, in several pieces. Um, I suspect that these may have ended up uh, where they did during the 1976 uh, cleanup phase. I, I think they were probably markers that had fallen over and were broken and the people that were, were trying to clean up the cemetery weren't necessarily sure what to do with them. Um, and so they went to a part of the cemetery that they thought was empty um, and dug a hole and, and, and put them in there, which is good that they didn't remove them from the cemetery entirely. Um, so we were able to, to find those, but at the same time, the area that they thought was empty, um, they actually came down directly on a burial and the poor um, gentleman in burial 143 did actually have several stones resting on his crania when we finally got down uh, to that level. Now the 23 markers that we found in the BM48 feature, we were actually able to reassociate 16 of them uh, to their original burial locations. Um, and you can see those here on the map uh, denoted by the, the blue stars. Um, of those uh, 23, the, the few that we can't, um, most of them are actually listed in the, the, the Union Title Cemetery book that I was telling you about. But for various reasons, um, I haven't quite been able to pinpoint exactly which burial is theirs, but I know generally what area of the cemetery they are likely buried. So that it is something that, that we are still working on. So some of the ways that we were able to reassociate these, these markers um, with the original location was actually through um, being able to find the bases of the markers, which had stayed sort of in the, the, the area of the actual burial with the markers that was found um, in the buried pit. So these are the markers for um, William and Mary Poland um, that were found in BM48. And this is after they've been cleaned and reassembled and then uh, re-erected at the New Bethel Cemetery. Um, but during that process, um, when they were, everything was still in the lab, when um, Jillian was doing the new grave marker survey, she very astutely noticed that the, um, the, the shape and the material and, and the size of these broken markers from the, the BM48 pit were consistent with um, the bases that were found in association with burial 190 and 191. So we were able to relatively early on um, reassociate these particular markers uh, with the burials of the Polans. And then after we um, came across the Union Title Cemetery book, those locations were actually reaffirmed as both of them uh, were listed in, in that document as well. Um, and then again, we used the sort of the, the spatial patterning uh, of the family groups to, to determine the location uh, of many of these as well. Um, it, we knew where Sarah Bassett David and, and William David were buried. Both of their um, burials were marked. However, we found the, the markers for three of their children, including um, Hiram, Elizabeth, and Milton um, in that uh, um, buried pit feature. But the, the osteological profiles and the, the ages and the artifacts for these burials here were all consistent um, with these, uh, these children or young adults. Um, so we were able to, again, very quickly reassociate them uh, to those particular burials uh, prior to the reburial process occurring. Um, and so some of the other things that we were able to do um, with reassociating these is, again, looking at family groups. Um, Daniel and Sarah um, Beck McCreary were ones that we really wanted to find as we knew they, they were early pioneers um, and Daniel was a veteran and we wanted to get his um, burial figured out before the reburial so we can get a, a military plaque for him. Um, and we were able to find that um, his daughter-in-law and two of his grandsons uh, again died about the same time 
uh, that uh, the Sarah and, and Daniel uh, did. And the burial, the profiles for burial 119 and 124 were consistent with all the information that we had um, for the McCreary. So we tentatively identified uh, those two burials as the McCreary's. And, and again, when we found the Union Cemetery book, those locations uh, were reaffirmed. Um, one of the, again, one of the more interesting ones that we were able to, to, to do actually through a lot of the genealogical work um, is Dennis Bracken. Um, one of his descendants had contacted us um, during the excavation process and said that the family actually wasn't sure where um, this particular, uh, his multiple times grandfather was buried um, because the death certificate said Valley Mills, Indiana. Um, and Valley Mills, having done all the research that I have, is actually a, a common place um, that was often referred to as it was the closest um, town uh, to the cemetery itself. So I, I looked at the, the burial closest to his wife and daughter, who again um, were marked, and 414 um, was definitely a burial that was consistent with somebody who died in 1921 at 101 years and eight months. Um, so we were able to, uh, again, affirm to his descendant that yes, he was buried there and this is exactly uh, where he was interred. Now, going back to um, our vault, um, this is a case of, of burial 289, um, which you can see in the map here, which was directly north of Abraham Worth. I always suspected that this burial was likely um, to be his wife, but prior to opening the vault, we didn't have any information on the, the biological sex or age of the individual, so that was just sort of speculation. But it was one of the ones that we had to open um, because the, the outer vault um, was in, in poor shape. And in the process of doing that, we uncovered uh, newspaper fragments that had been used as sort of cushioning under the body that still had um, readable text. Um, and there's a, many different phrases that we were able to sort of decipher from it. But again, the most exciting for any archaeologist is something that actually has a year on it. Um, and this not only had a year, it also had a month. Um, so I did a deep dive into the death certificates, trying to look at all women who died in the area in 1914. And I came up with the death certificate for Sarah Catherine Darnell, which was not her name. Um, I, I believe that this was an error, but it did say that she was um, buried in Bethel uh, in April of 1914. So I was able to concre um, concretely identify that particular burial as Abraham's wife with all of that sort of information as, as supporting evidence. Okay, and the last one I want to share with you, um, which is uh, one that is actually a very recent development that we, we have sort of figured out in the last um, couple of weeks, is Burial 219. Um, as you can see in the line drawing here, uh, his burial was very unique and it was very obviously unique uh, right off the bat um, while we were in the field, because while we did have relatively poor preservation um, of remains, the condition of um, the, the, the left leg of burial 219 was clear that this break was not a, a natural break that you would expect in a, in a post-depositional environment. And that was supported by the osteological analysis where you could actually see um, the saw marks on the leg and the, and the section of the femur here. So um, obviously this individual suffered some sort of catastrophic accident that, that greatly damaged his lower leg and there was an attempt to save him through amputation, but there was no evidence of any healing on any of the bones. So he clearly did not survive that intervention. Um, so we had been looking for quite a bit trying to find identification for him, but everything within his burial um, was consistent with an early period, an early A period burial. Um, so there was no decorative fittings, no evidence of any handles or, or coffin screws or anything like that. So all of the searches I had been doing at the time were focusing on somebody who died before 1854. Um, I was able to determine relatively quickly after we got the Union Cemetery book that this person was likely associated with the Kaufman family as the Kaufmans, are, which are located here, um, which again were March burials, um, Herschel Denny, Gordon Denny and Johnny Chamberlain were their grandchildren, and Thomas, who was also listed in the book, and George were their sons. I assumed that Braille 252 was George, even though it says probable female. Given his age, it wouldn't be unusual for that individual to be um, erroneously sexed as a, a probable female, even if they were a young adult male. Um, and artifacts um, in this burial were much more consistent with an 1864 date of death, which is what we had for, for George Kaufman. Um, so I was unsure who burial 219 was, but I was pretty sure it was a Kaufman. Um, so I, I started researching uh, newspaper articles uh, and ended up doing a keyword search 
on newspapers.com for the term amputate or amputation between 1827 and 1865. And there was a surprisingly number of hits, um, particularly because again, the Civil War happened in that period and those words tended to pop up a lot in news stories. But I did find a notice um, for a man named Coffin, which again, not Kaufman, but is not unusual for newspapers at these times to get names a little wrong, who suffered an accident at a mill um, on Mooresville Road, which I knew was very close to Valley Mills, um, where his leg was crushed in one of the machines and a doctor attempted to amputate, um, but his recovery is doubtful and we understand that he was a very, very worthy gentleman. Um, when I found this article, I, I can tell you it was the end of the day and I was very tired and I kind of went, well, the name's close, the, uh, the injury seems consistent, but we'll never know if this is actually it. And I went to bed. Um, and then I think my first conscious thought the next morning was I should actually look at the date of that and see if it's consistent with anybody that I have in the Kaufman family tree. And as soon as I looked at it, I realized that it was the exact date of death for George Kaufman, April 14th, 1864. So clearly burial 219 was George Kaufman, um, but he was just interred in a, a plain casket or a plain coffin, which again wouldn't necessarily be unusual in, in the case of a, a sudden and, and traumatic death uh, during this time period. Um, so that mystery was solved and it was one that I was really excited because now we have a lot more information that explains the injury um, that we observed. But unfortunately now I don't know who burial 252 is, so I, I'm, I'm continuing to, to research them. So we did identify a number of burials, um, which is great, but this whole process actually has included a number of burials, um, a, a list of individuals, uh, a longer list of individuals that we don't know exactly uh, which burials are associated with them. And one that probably bites me the most and the one that I, I really, really wanna figure out is actually Mary McCurry, the first burial in the cemetery. And we have a lot of tantalizing evidence uh, to sort of suggest that she was in fact buried there, which was a question for a while, um, including a picture of her marker that was uploaded to findagrave.com. I don't know by who, and I don't know when um, this picture was dated, but at some point she did have a burial marker um, out at Bethel. And then a 1964 request for genealogical information in the Indianapolis Star um, asking for information on the descendants of John and Daniel McCurry, and it includes a description of her marker and says that it is a joining one from Melinda Compton. Now I can tell you when I found this, I got really excited because I knew we had a marker from Melinda Compton. So I was like, oh, she's buried next to her, her granddaughter. This is great. And then I realized that Melinda Compton's was again, that one that wasn't actually associated with any burials. And I suspect the, the broken base that we found here in H2 is probably what is left uh, of this marker um, that again, I don't know when it necessarily disappeared um, from the landscape. Mary is included in the Union Title Book uh, Register. Um, actually, she's listed right above um, her uh, grandson-in-law, Obadiah. Um, but if you can see here, all of the burials in the area that where she is likely buried, um, there's some redundancy in, in the osteo profiles and, and the ages. So I'm pretty sure she is one of these, but I'm not sure which one yet. Um, and, and I'm hoping to maybe get some more information from the osteologist that might help me secure for sure which of these is the actual first burial that occurred at Bethel. I and mean, then the death certificate search, like I said, um, came up with, with quite a few um, names of individuals that we had no other record of, including multiple descendants of Lemuel Hand, um, who again now I suspect is probably also buried at Bethel. Um, but we have Ellen Hill, Alice Mendenhall, Jasper, William Jasper Hill, uh, Laura Hand, and Gerald Beasley are all descendants of this particular Decatur Township pioneer, and all of which um, were recorded as being buried at Bethel. So again, it's a matter of now reassociating um, this family group with, with burials um, that have been unmarked. But strangely enough, I, have, I came across another set uh, of family um, from this same time period with strangely similar uh, osteological profiles or, or ages and dates of death. So I haven't been able to figure out exactly which family group is which yet. But again, that, that's something I'm working on. So I didn't want all of this information to just be living in my head. Um, so I have created a, an appendix that it will be, that you can find in the uh, report when it is finished and distributed that basically walks through this entire process that I did for all of the individuals that I, I think are buried out there, but that we haven't been able to find yet. And it includes not only the, the biographical information that we have, but also um, lists all of the burials um, that are consistent with that, that age and, and the osteological profile. And then I also have sort of the narrative um, of 
the line of evidence and my line of thinking as to why I think they're buried there and where they might be in a very extensive reference section that includes hyperlinks to all of the records that I used throughout sort of describing um, the, this particular process. So um, somebody at some point, um, you know, long after me can sort of pick this up and, and maybe take it a little bit further. Okay, concluding remarks now that I am officially three minutes over, um, which is actually better than I thought I was gonna be. So I will, I will do this really quickly. Um, so what's next? Um, we need to complete the final report um, that has been a, a, an extremely um, a big task that we are still working on. As Jeannie mentioned, it is currently at about 1800 pages. I suspect when we're done, it's gonna be closer to 2000. And we've titled it, uh, You Who Were Young Twice and Twice Received a Tomb. Um, that is actually the epitaph off of Isaac Hoffman's marker, uh, which seemed just a little bit too appropriate uh, for this particular project to not use as a title. Uh, we are going to continue um, publishing um, peer-reviewed uh, journal articles, and we already have one that's been published by an IUPUI graduate student, uh, Gretchen Zoller, um, who did her master's work on the, a demographic assessment of the burial population, um, and she just had that article uh, published in the American Journal of Human Biology. And we're also looking towards um, producing a more general audience manuscript, um, more of a book style um, for uh, non-professionals that, again, sort of describes the project and everything that we've done. We're going to continue doing the genealogical research. I, I would really want to identify as many of these burials as possible, but particularly burials 198 and 200 are, are veterans. Um, and, and I think a big part of a lot of that identification process is going to be getting access to the original county death certificates in some sort of post-COVID um, era, whenever that happens to, to be. And I would like to explain some mysteries that we have out in the cemetery, uh, one of which, and, and again, I referenced uh, Norman uh, Russell Ferguson's marker here. Um, I wanted to bring it back around. Everything that I have been able to find about this uh, child and his parents um, leads me to believe that they have never, they never set foot in Indiana, let alone um, Bethel Cemetery or this area. All these individuals were born and raised and died in Ontario, Canada. Um, in fact, uh, on his record on Fire Grave and in various places on Ancestry.com, descendants of this family have posted comments and notes saying they have zero idea how or why this particular marker is in Indiana. So if anybody has any ideas or suggestions as to why a marker from Ontario, Canada will be, would be in a cemetery in central Indiana, I would love to hear um, some, some ideas because at this point I have no idea why this particular marker was here. And then again, to continue our dialogue with the descendant community. They have been um, amazingly supportive of this project. They have shared a lot of their research with us and we would like to do the same, making sure they have access to all of the data and all the information um, that we have co collected from their families. Okay, again, since I am way over time, I'm not gonna go through everybody who, who needs to be acknowledged uh, one by one. Um, everybody is listed here. I do need to call out, however, uh, our principal investigator, uh, Ryan Peterson, um, who has literally been the glue that has kept this, this crazy project together over many, many years. Um, we call him the great facilitator and, and without him, none of this uh, would have been possible uh, at all. Um, so if you have any questions um, or would like to contact me about anything about this project, my email is listed here, as is Jeannie's, and she will be the sort of the facilitator uh, of the report um, once it is available to the public. Um, and I also have references for everything that was included in this presentation. If you're interested, just feel free to contact me and I will definitely forward that along. Okay, I'm done. All right, we let, I, I have permission from Jessica to, to go over. So that's why I didn't cut okay. you off because I wanted you to finish. I appreciate that. We will try to get yes. some of these questions answered yes. if some of the other that we don't get tonight. So we'll do about 10 minutes of questions. We can um, answer some of them in an email and send about, say these were questions people had. So was the Bethel church moved or demoed? Um, there's not a lot of information on the church itself. Um, from what I understand, it stayed active in the original location that um, Mr. McCreary um, sort of deeded to until the 1960s, um, in which case it merged with um, the, uh, a, the Maywood Bethel Church and formed um, Aldersgate Methodist Church which I have not been able to determine if whether or not that church is still active. Um, again, all of this information sort of came from um, the state library trip, which happened right before lockdown. So I haven't been able to, to um, sort of track down a lot of this, but I believe that original church location was demoed shortly after that. Okay. 
Were the graves cleaned before the photogamma? Yeah, Alex's yeah. stuff. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, um, we made an effort to um, remove all of the surrounding matrix. Um, and as best we could, though, we left artifacts um, in place so we can get a good documentation of where exactly things found uh, were found. Um, sometimes those things had moved a little bit within the burials. A lot of times uh, the, the burials would fill with water and things would sort of get um, moved around a little bit. But yes, we made sure that at every burial um, was as clean of dirt as possible um, before the photogrammetry process. So um, I, I really wanted to, to show some of those or to, sh to show the process that we went through um, for this. But again, um, I'm gonna let Alex deal with all of that amazing technology because he's really the one who, who brought it to the project and developed those protocols for us. Um, and the, a lot of the amazing uh, the, uh, images that we have are, are really due to, to him. What's the earliest date for the concrete vaults? Um, you know, I am not 100% sure because I did not write that chapter. Jillian O'Cray wrote that chapter and she was the only one who managed to get her chapters done early. So it's been a while since I've done it. <laughs> um, but I do believe uh, most of the, the concrete vaults didn't really start uh, coming into significant use until about the 1890s um, and weren't real common until after that. They weren't required by law at that point. So um, it was more of a, a decision by the family as to whether or not they wanted uh, to purchase one uh, for their, their loved ones, which I think is one of the reasons why, I mean, we have again, burials up to um, 1921 and 1935 that were not vaulted. So it was more of an individual choice. Um, so they asked what the, was used to clean the stones. I can answer this. Um, they, uh, and somebody wanted to know who the tombstone expert was. It was Carl Shetler from um, Harrison County Cemetery Preservation um, Group, and they used ammonia and water um, for the vast majority and a soft bristle natural brush to clean most of it off. Um, I think they did do some, um, they tried D2 on some of them, so. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I'm still amazed at the, the way a lot of them turned out after the cleaning process. I mean, you, you yeah. could see and the, the um, Mary Poland example from when it first came out of the ground to what it looked like when we put it uh, up in Concordia. Um, and, and it's, it's an amazing, uh, amazing transformation. Um, how involved is the permit process to undertake this? <laughs> That's uh, our office and yeah. I'm gonna yeah. let that Jeannie decide to, to handle that one. Um, let's just say that it's not something that you're gonna go do tomorrow. You have to be qualified. Um, there's, a, there's a whole long process of it, and we're not going to let you dig up your ancestor because you want to see what coffin they're buried in. So it's, it's a long process that runs through our office because we monitor for ethics, responsibility, all that kind of stuff. Um, what sources were used to determine the difference between a coffin handle's creation and then the popularity? Yes. Um, again, I have to give all credit to Dr. Davidson from U University of Florida um, because he has done all of that research and has published it in, in multiple um, in places. In fact, one of uh, a report that he uh, published on a, a similar type of cemetery in um, Arkansas has become what I, I call my Bible that I have sort of used um, to, to come up with this chronology. But basically what Dr. Davidson has done is he has done a, a very thorough patent search to identify when certain te technologies um, were first patented, but then has done a very thorough catalog search to see when those uh, types of material showed up in the catalog, which again, those often are, can be very different dates. You know, when something's patented, that doesn't mean it is um, automatically then sort of produced and available to the public. And then not only that, you know, even if something's available to the public, doesn't necessarily mean people are going to buy it. So he has then, then done a, a very extensive um, comparative analysis of other cemetery excavations throughout the country to see when are we actually starting to see these uh, pop up in the archaeological record. So what are the dates of the burials where we're, we're seeing this? So basically, he's come up with three different dates. Um, and what we tend to use for our burial estimates is when were people actually starting to use them? When were they, you know, acquiring them? Um, and one of the things that I'm trying to do um, in the, the artifact chapter, which I am still working on, um, is a look at a lot of these um, artifacts we were able to actually find the exact, exa uh, exact examples of in coffin hardware catalogs, which again were provided to us by Dr. Davidson, who was very gracious to share those with us. Um, 
So I, what I want to do, since we have so many March burials or burials where we have very firm dates, start doing uh, more ex uh, um, exploration of looking at the style and the aesthetic of certain uh, hardware types, particularly the handles. So individuals who may be doing this kind of work that don't have access to those Kaufman uh, catalogs can say, okay, we found one that looks just like this one from Bethel. It's the same general style, James, the same um, aesthetic, and that burial is from 1886. So we can maybe estimate that this burial that we're working in is from the 1880s. So th that's kind of how th that sort of works. Okay. We got time for one more. If we didn't answer your question, like I said, we'll go through, we'll get, we can get the questions and then um, between Brooke and myself, we can um, finish up the, the, the questions and we can send them when we send the link for the live um, version. But this is the one, and this is a question someone asked and I want to know the answer to because I had never seen this resource. The okay. Union Title Cemetery Survey, is it available online or is it only at the library? It is only at the library. Um, okay. so Oh, it has not been digitized. Um, I scanned the pages specific to Bethel while I was there, which again, I am endlessly grateful that I decided to just take a day and go at the beginning of last March. I don't think I really realized that it would probably be over a year before you know I would have access to, to that again. Um, so yeah, no, it is, it is not available online as far as I know, but anybody who's been to the genealogical collection at the State Library, um, they have wonderful document scanners that you can use for free. Um, so I, again, I just scanned the pages for, for Bethel um, and I'm endlessly grateful to the librarian who, who found that resource because it was about as random as it, it could be. Because again, the title of it had nothing to do with Bethel, had nothing to do with cemeteries, um, but it was an amazing resource. All right, well, we'll all be fist fighting for that at the State Library now. Um, so again, we're, we're a little over. So the rest of the questions, like I said, we'll, we'll try to get them answered through the emails. Um, and several people have asked about the report. Once the report is approved by our office and it closes out the project, um, Brooke has, has is gonna work on this. Ryan has said he'd help me work on this. We're gonna um, redact what legally needs to be redacted, um, deal with taking out photos of human remains. It's, it's not appropriate to, to have that, you know, kind of all over the place. Um, and so we will have a public version. I don't have a date yet, because I'm still, we're still waiting for Brooke's chapter. Um, and <laughs> getting, no, so, I'm but, not so the only will, one. Yeah, so we will, and then we'll make that available. It's going to be available on, um, you know, we'll be able to send it to people. We're probably going to link it to the um, our database of, um, we call Shard, which is uh, the structures and um, cemetery database through the Office of the Department of Natural Resources. And so just keep an eye out for it that way, but that will be available. And then so a lot of the genealogical information that Brooke has so amazingly put together will be available to the public. But please email me for that and not Brooke, because once she's done with this, she's going to probably have another project that she's working on. And I will be able to get that to you um, again when it becomes available. So Dr. Drew, thank you so much. This was spectacular. You got a ton of amazing, outstanding, you're wonderful. Again, I want to be you and come study with you. Um, uh, I, I, I'm more than happy to, to present. Um, I apologize again for going over. I, I promise I edited this down multiple times before tonight, but there were just some things I couldn't bring myself to cut. So thank you, everybody. It was spectacular. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for attending and come in April when you get to hear and see um, Alex and talk about the, the photogrammetry stuff, which is also very cool.